Hey, what is going on everybody? And it's the next big thing once again back with another Star vs. The Forces of Evil analysis video. And I'm just gonna lay it out right now. These couple of episodes were pretty awesome, and that's including the Ponyhead episode. But of course, before we can get into analyzing part B of this episode, we're gonna first start off with part A of this episode, The Night Shift. <laughs> And from the beginning of this episode, we have a ceremony specifically for Squires becoming knights, including Marco Diaz himself. Plus, there's the return of Higgs the Squire, and um, there's more on her later on in this episode. During the ceremony, we clearly see Star cheering Marco on as he achieves his goal into becoming Muni's knight. And then afterwards, it's revealed to the fact that Star has also sewed a cape representing their past memories. And while watching this scene, it made me think and realize, um, are they gonna get rid of that cape that he's always wearing in the intro of this show it was already revealed to be king river's meat napkin and plus its intro still includes toffee possessing ludo as well as eclipse of being crystallized and as we all may know um both events have already came and gone away but i suppose unlike the meat cape that he received back earlier in season three this explains as to why marco is seen posing with a blue cape on in the intro since this is most likely to be the true cape and as for the ludo and eclipse scene maybe disney just got lazy at that point. And after Star is giving Marco his gift, she then decides to let him meet Mr. Crandall, as we all know him, Mr. Candle, basically. The dude obviously has been trying to live incognito after he was originally dubbing the name Mr. Candle in Eco Creek working for Tom. Mr. Crandall even has the same exact cat statue that Tom was using to spy on Marco. I mean, come on. We even see Mr. Crandall flying on his trusty cabinet later on in this episode like how he did in the ending of that episode in season two. Now, another fun fact about the guy is that he also teaches everyone's lifelong jobs on Muni just as he did on Earth. And when I say lifelong, I mean lifelong. Marco even decides not to become a knight just because he wanted to make sure that he didn't become a knight for all of eternity. Which is news that Star unfortunately is unbeknownst of until Marco arrives back, revealing the fact that he no longer wants to have that. He even goes on to explain that college and family is still an indefinitely significant reasoning for returning back on Earth, and that he can't stay on Muni forever, obviously. And don't you dare make sad eyes, Star, because you know darn well you gave Marco the position for him to permanently remain on Muni. Tch, she knows what she was secretly rooting for. Blood Moon curse my ass. We even have these nice mini separate scenes where both Star and Marco are talking to Manfred, who is still stoned, by the way. <laughs> if you know what I mean. But anyways, that's besides the point. That just shows truly just how close their relationship is even after the Blood Moon curse and how similar both Star and Marco are and how hard it is for them to both express each other's feelings towards each other. A little later on, Marco is then kidnapped by the rest of the knights alongside with the other squires in order for them to have their night out party. And all is fine until Marco then later on reveals to them as well that he no longer wants to be a knight. So, of course, everyone's reaction is to then turn against Marco for almost absolutely no reason. And it's quite ironic how Star was just about to save Marco from all of this, except for the fact that she then realized that he needed his own space, apparently. And by the way, this is indeed the same exact battle gear that she used back in Season 1. And one major issue that I believe I will say that the Blood Moon curse being broken did help with was their complete obsession with each other. Because I'm sure with the Blood Moon curse, things would have ended up a lot more differently. But before this, and there was also a scene with Star explaining the situation to Eclipsa, who, by the way, is shown displaying Meteora play cards until the very last one being a symbol of a purple skeleton. Meteora then claps her hands in glee, with Eclipsa replying with very good. Seriously, if this isn't their way of deceiving us on whether or not Eclipsa and or Meteora is a potential threat, then I don't know what is. Purple is usually the color of Eclipsa's dark magic, and the skeleton pretty much says it all death, darkness, and well, the other side. You know, the, the side that's that's not good. Um, yeah. Gosh, I just can't wait until we get an answer already. So moving forward with Marco's part of the story, he also is then tortured some more after Mr. Crandall even confirms through the book that they are supposed to torture him for not taking the night shift. So when the rest of their torture devices don't seem to work out against Marco, Sir Stabby attempts to burn Marco's cape gift from Star in order to get a rise out of him. Which, unfortunately for his sake, actually works because Marco even warns him not to do so before going ultra instinct on this man. 
I swear your face will hit every surface in this room, and when you wake up, you'll be in the belly of that dragon. Oh, really? I wasn't joking. Yeah, so uh, Marco wins like a boss and explains that there's more to life than just one lifelong lasting job. But of course, everyone is still stubborn on how their perspective on knighting is, including Higgs, until she and the rest are told about the Never Zone, the same dimension where Marco apparently achieved being knighted nine times and is the most dangerous dimension of them all. Higgs returns only to be disappointed with her true physical self and walks back into the Never Zone dimension to live there instead, to which I tip my hat to because because honestly, Higgs was and still is a jerk towards Marco for believing that he didn't even earn the title of becoming a squire, even after everything he explained to her. Towards the ending of this episode, Marco meets up with Star on the roof to talk with her about visiting Muni in the future but still not staying. Star, of course, is agreeing with him and understands the fact that he has to go to Earth very soon in order to see his family and get a college degree and all the other stuff. But I mean, what's going on, Star? I thought Tom was your boy. I mean... <laughs> Surely you can live without Marco going away for a few months to a year to decades, having his own children with a different wife that wasn't you, and I mean, <laughs> what's wrong with that, right? But besides that, another thing to cheer up Star, Marco also decides to give her a cape similar to what she gave him earlier in the episode. And after watching it a couple times, I realized that Marco must have stayed up from night to day making the cape since we clearly see them sitting on the roof during sunrise. And I don't know about you, but like I said in my other analysis video, including the curse of the blood moon, um, yeah. Having the curse of the blood moon being finally lifted away from them was a great thing. Because once again, we are revealed to their true feelings towards each other without some silly curse overriding everything. And staying up all night sewing a cape together for one of your best friends is true dedication. Oh yeah, when both Star and Marco's capes are together side by side, it creates a little heart. <laughs> and so now that we have that over with, we have the very next episode titled... Queen napped. Which, spoiler warning, by the way, <clears throat> I totally thought was going to be a serious episode where Queen Eclipsa was going to be queen napped by Mina Loveberry or something. And by the way, if you haven't seen it yet, check out my Ghost of Butterfly Castle analysis video because it is definitely a significant one. Star and the rest are then notified by the Ransom Graham mail delivery lady from two other episodes of a new clue leading to Eclipse's location. And plus, there's even a Reflecticore bill mailed to Star after magically vanishing the equipment the other episode. I suppose it's like what Seahorse was trying to explain to Star. She should have just pulled the plug. And in speaking of Seahorse, there was also a funny joke about how he apparently was also scolded on his job for the store's properties being lost. But during the search for Eclipse, a Ponyhead decides to start a live blog post story in order for people to get more involved and concerned. Even though some of them blatantly admit to enjoying the drama more than her actual safety the most. So throughout the episode, clue after clue, they eventually realize that the last clue, including the lines of being able to see Star but not getting wet, meant that it was referring to reflections. And I must admit, Star is an ultimate beast when it comes to her detective skills and figuring the riddle. I guess she gets it from her grandmother. And plus, Star is notably known to be wise. I mean, my dude Marco couldn't even figure it out, and I personally was believing throughout the episode that the culprits were using Photoshop or something. He tries to even take a crack at it by saying that Eclipsa was trapped inside of a mirror, but Star breaks it down explaining how she received a Reflectacore bill and how they asked for one thousand pounds of gold, which was the exact amount that the shadowy figures from the beginning requested for the sake of Eclipse's safety. So they eventually make it to an abandoned Reflecticore building only to find out that the entire thing was a setup from the get-go. The entire time, the Ponyheads alongside with Ponyhead herself arranged the supposed kidnapping and all just for others to finally show some compassion towards Eclipsa. And the monster tentacle face mask that Eclipsa was wearing throughout the episode was virtual reality headgear for a game. It was also a great way for Ponyhead to trap her sisters into going to jail since they have done some pretty wicked crimes in the past. Like for example, attempting to slander Ponyhead out of jealousy for her being the oldest and the royal princess of the family. Ugh. And now in the words of Star herself, what Ponyhead did was in no way good, but 
she did miraculously bring Muni together, and the approval rating as opposed to the Ponyhead show episode skyrocketed. And well, I guess it's true that a good drama is all that people need at times. Also, that Reflecticore bill was no joke, however. <laughs> Man, I guess Star will have to start working back in the mineshaft again. Well, that about does it for these two episodes. I believe the very next two are even more serious. However, I haven't viewed them yet, so until then, I guess I'll have to catch you all in the next one. Peace!